Hello, everyone. I'm Father Enrique Salvo, Rector of St. Patrick's Cathedral and the Basilica of St. Patrick's, the old cathedral where we are right now. And we have a great surprise for everyone. Father Mike Schmidt is with us here. And we are so happy that you are here, not just right now in this conversation, but just in New York. We have great, great plans with the Eucharistic procession, and we're just so grateful that you're here. Thank you for your time. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. This is great. How you, you, you come to New York a few times, right? My little brother moved out here. He lives in Brooklyn. He's been out here for maybe a dozen years or so. Uh -huh. And so I'd never been here before, uh, before he moved out here. And then since then, maybe, I don't know, a handful of times between, somewhere between six and 10 times, I think I've been, been here. Enough to, to be able to be the person who's like, here's the crazy thing. It's, it's probably not your experience because you have lived here forever, right? Like more, more, years. For a long time. <laughs> yeah. So my first couple of times out here, I was like, oh, that's from that movie. And that's from that TV show. And like I'm driving, on, driving around Manhattan to go and like just pointing out all the places I've seen uh -huh. because, you know, I'm such a tourist. Well, actually, we do it too. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. So hey, that never changes. And there's always new movies. So yeah, yeah, I guess they make them. So, um, yeah, so we're so happy that you're here. And one thing that, you know, we were thinking about what's good questions to ask Father Mike Schmidt when he's here. And we were thinking, let's begin with the basics. And I know that sometimes they ask us, uh, what's your vocation story, Father? Like, like over dinner, like between bites. And I know it's a complicated question because there's so much to it. And I tell people, well, it's, it, thank you for asking, but it's like getting married, you know, there's a lot of steps. So it's not like something that is a quick, but that being said, what's your vocation story? <laughs> <laughs> All that. Yeah. Um, being said, yeah. So uh, the quick, well, I remember there used to be a time, and maybe this is true for you too, but I remember I could probably pull out that story to like two hours long. It's just, you know, and then, the, then you learn people don't want to hear the two hour long version. Yeah, and never not between bites in the <laughs> restaurant. Like, are you done yet? Um, so I would say this, I was uh, raised in a Catholic family. I'm one of six kids and uh, I'm the fourth. What number? Number four. Four. Um, and I'm the middle of the middle. So number three and number four are the middle, but my older brother is the first boy. And so I'm the middle of all of them. So it's two girls, two boys, girl, boy. And so I'm that. Oh, okay. So, so I think that means I'm the most well-adjusted <laughs> because, <laughs> because I got cared for by my older siblings and I got to care for the younger ones. That's actually awesome. You know, or I got tortured by the older ones and I got to torture the young ones. You get this balance. So, so I was raised um, there in Catholic. And when I say Catholic, I, I always thought this was just a normal Catholic family in the sense that uh, we went to mass every Sunday and I knew my parents prayed and we went to Catholic elementary school. And uh, it was like faith was real, but it wasn't like we weren't over the top in any way. It was just kind of seemed really normal. And in the, yeah, anyways, people sometimes look at that and say, that's not normal. But I'm like, well, that was my normal. And I didn't like going to church. I didn't like Catholic school. Um, I uh, remember even, I think I must have been in fifth or sixth grade where, uh, and what the teacher reminds me of this now, but she said that at one point she was play, praying, playing Christian music in class. And Apparently, I said, maybe the seventh grade, I said, is this some of that Jesus freak music? And are you a Jesus freak aster? Like, where have I heard, where have you ever heard this term before? I was, it's 1980. Um, and she said, be real careful because he, Jesus is going to get a hold of you and he's going to change your life. I'm like, yeah, whatever. I hope not. As a seventh grader. <laughs> she was right. Yeah, she was. <laughs> um, so at one point, though, everything changed for me. I was about 15 years old or so. And it was a movement of the Holy Spirit. I mean, just, it was a moment where I was, just aware of my own brokenness. I was, I became, became convicted by my sin. That was what it was. That, that at one point I knew what the commandments were. I knew what was wrong and right because I went to Catholic school and all this. And then, but it was a moment of interiorly just, I wasn't like busted. I wasn't like, you know, uh, and no one ever knew, but it was this conviction of, wait a second, that's what I've done. It was like, I, I know the sins, I've done that. And it was, again, it was movement of the Holy Spirit because it was a conviction that moved to this conclusion. And the conclusion was two things. One, I need to pray. And the second thing I knew was I need to go to confession. Like that was, that was the number one thing, number one and two. And so the, uh, that sense of, I need to pray. I didn't know how to pray. And I wasn't going to ask my mom. I know she prayed the rosary about every day, but I wasn't going to say, mom, how do you pray? She said, why would you do wrong? <laughs> um, so I just remember I, I was at religious education, uh, you know, Wednesday night classes. And there was this little book booklet called youth praise the rosary. And so I said to Mrs. Haglin, who was our teacher, like, Mrs. Haglin, could I borrow that book? And she's like, yeah, take it. You can have it. So I remember I would just, every day I would read that book and like 
this is how you pray the rosary. And it just, it changed my life. Our Lady, incredible. But the other thing I knew I needed to do is I needed to go to confession. And so I didn't know what the rules were. And so I uh, knew where the priest lived yeah. and I knew I had a bicycle. So I got on my bike and rode across town and 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, just knocked on the priest's door and he was home because you know priests only, only work one day a week. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, Father, can I go to confession? Sure, come on in. And I went to confession. And I remember as I watch, walked out of that house on the porch, um, I had these three deep thoughts that were just so powerful. One was, God, thank you. I was, I was so grateful. Just God, thank you so much. You just set me free. I mean, I walked in dead in my sins and I knew this as a 15 year old and you just set me free. My second thought was, God, if you want me to be a priest, I'll hear anyone's confession anytime they ask me. And I'd never thought about being a priest. I mean, I didn't like going to mass, you know, so, but there's a moment of like, I this gratitude over God has forgiven me. If he wants me to be a priest, I will do what that priest just did. I will hear anyone's confession anytime they ask. My third thought was, she's really cute. Like, you know, so there was this like, ah, what do I do? So all throughout uh, junior high, high school, and even college, it was that sense of like, oh my gosh, I don't know what God wants me to do. And so, but it was just going back to prayer. And um, I majored in theology in college at a normal, at a, at a Catholic college. Um, and uh I was a missionary after college, and that's where I. Oh yeah, what type of missionary? Um, I, I, yeah, have you heard of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity? I'm not sure. That's okay. So <laughs> they are based out of Texas, I think, okay. based out of Texas, and uh, they have missions all over the world. And one of them was on the border of Belize and Guatemala. And so oh. I went down there and I taught at a Catholic high school for a year, for one year. Um, wow. And it was a, uh, it was, it changed my life. It changed my life. I mean, it actually saved my life because I needed another conversion at that time because I had hardened my heart to the church. So the Lord had won me and I had like, this is amazing, Jesus, this is true, the Eucharist. I mean, that was something that the whole other conversion um, and realizing, oh, the, the church is real. Jesus founded the church. But then in college, there was all these other thoughts that were like, well, the church is backwards and the church is wrong and here's all the church needs to catch up to modern society. And so I ended up ended up really hating the Catholic church. I would, I would say Christian out loud, I wouldn't say Catholic out loud after this degree that I got. But then I went down to this mission and they were like Catholic with a capital C. And it was, I remember at first I was like, we were put up my dukes. I was fighting the priests all the time. It's such a, I was the biggest jerk to them. There's a whole other story about that. Um, but uh, the Lord got a hold of me again and just broke my heart. And I remember I, I, got, I got to fall in love with the Lord's church again. And then it was like, okay, that's the invitation to be a priest. Or at least to try it out. Oh. There's more to it, but that yeah, yeah, but no, that's, that's, I, that's, a, that's, that's awesome. the two-hour version, <laughs> and and the people I'm sure were big. Oh yeah, the the people because that's so beautiful working, isn't it, uh, with with people in in in, in these situations because God speaks through them so many yeah. times, and it's like the gospel comes alive in these scenarios. Well, so what a beautiful experience that you had, and also I mean it, it was them, they were the ones who the people I worked with and and you know served that, uh, yeah, that were part of the spoke truth and just really loved well when I was a jerk, you know, and was really uh, hard to love. They, they loved well. Well, uh, thank God. Yeah, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. <laughs> and and uh, I'm, the church is happy that happened. <laughs> and it, it, that's, and, and it, you know, I was vocation director for a while. Really? For a few years here in, in the archdiocese. That's a hard job. It actually was kind of hard, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's beautiful. You know, it's beautiful to see, like, all the guys that I worked with, and I remember when they were there, and the whole thing. And they're really raw, and then now they could more mature. Yeah, and, and the doubts, and, like, am I going to make it? And now, I'm like, getting ordained, and they're, a br like, a bunch of great new priests. Yeah. It's, that's, that's really, it's years later, oh, yeah. but it's really moving. But, but yeah, like you say, they're so, they're, they're like, and our heart usually is not in the right place when we get the call. Yeah. And everyone thinks that if, if someone would come and say, I am, I'm, I have it, Father, I, I'm going to be a priest, is usually not accurate and perhaps not a real vocation. So it's beautiful to see that. Like, well, you just explained, though, how, how, the Holy, how the Holy Spirit is going to take care of just like moving it in so many ways. So I mean, again, I'm so grateful. I mean, so going back to the my time in 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 the mission, there were these two priests. One was Father John uh, McHugh, who's one, who's one of the co-founders of Salt, and the other was a younger priest at the time, uh, Father Tony Blunt was his name, Father Anthony Blunt, and uh, and I again, I was just a, a jerk to them. Like I, like I 
I would go to daily mass still, even though I was, you know, at odds with the church, I would go to daily mass because I know Jesus is in the Eucharist. I know this is true. And, um, but during their homilies, I would like, pfft, I'd be making faces like that. That's wrong, you know? And now I know what we both know, which is you can see everything from up there. Like, oh yeah, yeah, everything, everything. everything. If someone is <laughs> nodding off, you know, like you can see everything. all of that. Yeah. And, and so, you know, and I was just, I was always arguing with them and just kind of again, mocking them and stuff. So after I had this conversion, another conversion, you know, and that, that went into the seminary. And the next summer, uh, there was a couple of our missionaries who were marrying each other. And so Father Anthony and Father uh, John were concelebrating. And I remember I caught them in the, in the parking lot before the wedding. I just needed to apologize. So I, well, Father Tony, Father John, I'm really sorry. I'm so sorry for, you know, all that time that year. I was such, you know, I was so, such a jerk, this, that. And you would have thought they wouldn't, that they didn't notice. They were like, oh, no, 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 no problem. You know, like, and so that, and then I started thinking, wait, maybe I wasn't so bad. Like maybe I, I maybe, maybe that was all in my head. So I was kind of under that impression for a while that, yeah, maybe I just, maybe I wasn't so bad. So fast forward, I'm ordained now and I'm working at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Some of our students have graduated and have joined SOLT. So they joined the, joined the order. Um, one of them, her name is Danny. Uh, Danny had Father Tony as her formator. And so she said, ah, Father Tony. So Father Mike was my priest in college. And he says that, that he was kind of a, gave you guys some headaches, you know? And she said this, she said, he put, he said, the man put his face in his hands and started like rubbing his face, rubbing his temples. And he said, <laughs> he said, the number of nights that Father John and I stayed up and talked about like, what are we going to do with this guy? Like how, what, he is the worst. Like, do we send him home? Do we give him another chance? Like, I, and I was like, are you serious? Because then when I apologize to you guys, no, no problem, no big deal. But I cost them so many nights of sleep and I, mm, I knew it was true because I was a turd. I was not a... <laughs> and here you are. And here we are. That's I'm so counts. grateful again. That's that, what counts. Back to the Lord. I'm so grateful. So grateful to God. And it's so beautiful because uh, that you went through that experience. And, and now, in a way, not only are... You're like a missionary now with, your, with the gift that God has given you to reach so many people in their homes. So you, you, you now, Father, Father Mike goes everywhere to reach the gospel... Of, of and of course everything that you do to, to people's homes to people's hearts and now you're the one talking and now yeah. you're the one. <laughs> give me eye roll <laughs> and, and, and no but everyone you know it's such a gift that you 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 you're it's like almost like God has has given you that from the beginning you know to 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 be that that missionary and so speaking of that something something that um, it's good for us to always consider. You that go to a lot of places, right? You go to, like to conferences. You go you, plus you reach so many people like like, like this, and, and and thank God for the way you listen to your vocation, and thank God for God's patience because He needs to have patience with all of us, or none of us would be here. And still, of course, how? What do you think about? You know, you said you had some criticisms with the church back then, where you didn't know now, and so on. But what do you think about the church now? The church, especially in the United States. Do you think it's alive? I hope. Or do you think it's like, you know, like sometimes like they, people like to say, oh, the numbers are down. No one's going to mass anymore. It's the last generation. Uh, what's your experience though? Because you are seeing the church in a very beautiful way, in a very powerful way that you're seeing a bit of the church everywhere, which is a yeah. gift. Yeah. So, so. We would love to hear what your opinion is about the state of the church right now. Yeah, so... It, and I know it's a big question, but... <laughs> but <laughs> that's a great question because... So when I... My issues were that the church... The, on the hot button issues, the church was behind the times. The church was against the culture. And there's all these other Christians who say X and Y and Z are fine. So why are we, you know, the holdouts when it comes to some certain things? And so it was a church teaching kind of an issue. And then I would ask the priests and I would ask the nuns and ask the professors at my school, like, why is this? And I was always given kind of a dismissive answer. It was like, well, it's, you know, that comes, that's going to change. Don't worry about this. And, and so I just, I never was given, here's the reason why. And that, that was my, I, I would say that's my main issue. My other main issue is pride. And I'm a, as I said, I'm a jerk. And so that sense of like, I was ready to grab onto a non-answer and just harden my heart to the church's teaching. Um, now, when it comes to teaching, I think right now there are so many people in this country, 
and other places uh, who are faithfully teaching the the Lord's word. They're faithfully teaching uh, what we believe as Catholics. And and I again, I've, I've been the recipient. I've been the the beneficiary, if that's the right word. I think of the people who have taught. I mean, I, I just think of all the people who have helped me come to know God and come help me come to know the church. There's great teachers right now. Um, when it comes to the state of the church, as you're asking, uh, is it alive? Last night we had mass um, just in our small-ish town, small, smallish community. I think there were, we were at our, we were at our cathedral um, on Sunday night and just a normal mass and it was packed. There was hardly any room for uh, a, any extra people. And it's just like, I remember there's a young man and he had graduated in 2022. And so a year and a half or, or so ago, and he walked out and he said, hey, my name's Cooper. I wish that I was Catholic when I was in college because he just graduated. And I wish I was Catholic at, when I was in college because I, and he pointed back into the church. He's like, cause I missed out on this for four years. That's what I, that's what I needed for four years. And I didn't even know it was there. And I was like, oh, you're in RCIA right now? He's like, yep, I'm in RCIA. I'll be, I'll become Catholic uh, this Easter. And I just think that's an awesome because there is life. And this is just a normal, again, kind of college town. Um, but I see people saying yes uh, all of the time. And then, as you said, going all over the place. So tomorrow night, what are they expecting? They're expecting 3,000 people. 3,000 people at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And like, and for a Eucharistic procession. Yeah, that's a, that takes people out of the comfort uh, around, zones. Around Times Square, everyone. That's going to be powerful. And that takes people out of the comfort zones. And, and I'm so glad you're saying all this because I agree 100% myself. And, you know, being in St. Patrick's Cathedral, I also have, the, I have that, which is a, a different, you know, but I still get to see the church from, a, ver, from this perspective. We have 6 million people that come in through the doors of St. Patrick's Cathedral, of, yeah, every year. Of course, some were, many tourists, it's a staple in the city. But every single day, the masses are packed. Uh, maybe not standing room only, right. but you see so big, big many church. people. <laughs> yeah, that's what, you see so many people of all ages, all walks of life. In this case, all the nations of the yeah. world, and you see the reverence that most people all have, and like the love, and and you see, and they come with whatever need, and you can see like the how much you're really trusting, and how much they need that prayer to be answered, and they knew they know who to turn to. You see the way that, that at least they're trying their best to pay attention to us, and you know we can't see everything, and, and so, and, and 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 you know, and to learn. And here in the Basilica, we have a great young adult mass every Saturday, every Sunday at seven. That's also packed. So many young adults want to follow. Look how many people are are so. I mean, you're doing great, and in fact, thank God with everything with with Bible in the year, the Catechism in the year, but. If, if the church was dead, no matter how awesome you did, the numbers wouldn't be there, the, the viewers wouldn't be there, the listeners wouldn't be there. So I think that we have to remind people of that and not let, not let all the negators uh, say, oh, the church is about to die because it's not true. And I think the haters want to, us to believe that. Yeah. The people that are not going to church, of course we can use more people. Of course, are, is everyone living a perfect life? No, not even inside the church really are many times. We all need, as you say, confession and conversion. But I think people are trying and I think the Holy Spirit is moving. Yeah. And that's the most important thing. Well, I completely agree. There, and like you mentioned, all ages as well. So I, I, I see a revival in uh, teens, young adults, but also there is, you mentioned the Bible in the year, there are so many people who are not young, but who are well into their years, who are for the first time ever listening to the Bible. So um, yesterday morning, again, after the morning mass, there were a number of couples, like we're from Texas, came up to Duluth. Uh, we're from California, came up and just wanted to say, hey, and say that listening to the Bible, and it's the Bible, that's not me, it's obviously, it's, it's God's word. They said, it changed my life. And I'm like, oh, thanks. And they're like, no, and the guy's grabbing my hand. He's probably in his seventies. He's like, no, you don't understand. It's changed my life. And his wife sent, sent next to him saying, yeah, it's changed both our lives. And just, you're thinking, it's incredible. I got stopped in the airport today. This guy, he's a ref for the NBA. And he was like, hey, uh, here's the deal. I have a bunch of guys in my home parish and we're going through the Bible and now we're going through the catechism and we are just on fire as, as these kind of uh, middle age, for lack of a better term, in their 40s, you know, um, 40, 50 uh, dads who are just like, 
we're ready to go. We're ready to uh, take this seriously. We're ready to be saints and their lives are transformed because God's still moving. He's still working. It's amazing. That's the yeah, that's so awesome, man. It's so real, and that's another point. Yeah, and and and, and Ryan, you're you're definitely one of the ones the Holy Spirit's using for this. I remind people many times that not only is the Holy Spirit moving, we have the privilege right now. Don't you think that more than obviously in any other time in history, we have access to learn in our in our fingertip in our pockets. Yeah. And like, I, I remind people, like it used to be like, you had to be a theologian and buy like volumes of like all these books and, and, and who can actually explain it to you. And of course the church has always tried her best to teach. And of course the cat, we wouldn't be here if, if it wasn't for like 2000 years of, of the faith being handed on generation to generation. But we live in an age like never before that we have no excuse to not nurture our faith. And, and, and that has to count for a lot. Yeah, I mean, oh, absolutely. Again, thank you for being one of the pioneers in, in, in doing that. But it's such a, it's such a thing that we, have, uh, we don't have an excuse anymore, especially since, you know, the more we know something, the more we love something, the more we love something, the more we want to know. And, and, yeah. and, and, if, and if we all got on board, like I always recommend everyone the Hollow app, which I know you're, you're in it and, and uh, so, many, so many great talks are in it. I mean, it, it, it's, it's really powerful what, what we can have right now and what, what, what is happening. And, and we have to thank God for that and, and continue to like make it grow and, and, and just like let the Holy Spirit keep on moving and, and, and remind people because there's still a lot of people that don't know, but it's happening. Yeah, and it's so accessible. It's so accessible. I, so so I, even think, I even think about um, when I was in high school, college, even after college, and how many cassette tapes I would listen to. Yeah. So you have Dr. Scott Hahn, his, all his talks, Patrick Madrid, his talks. I remember Father Benedict Rochelle, and I'll just listen to these guys, number of other, number of other people as well, uh, Fulton Sheen, so on these cassette tapes. And I yeah. just, I just, yeah, I got so much out of this. And, and yet you have one set of cassettes and as opposed to now you have all this information and hopefully it's getting better and better. I mean, those guys, you can't top them, but, uh, but the access is so, uh, you can be driving and saying, I want to learn about this and just type it into YouTube and boom, here's a talk on it. And it's incredible. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all there and, and it's beautiful. And, 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 uh, and of course, and the, and the more people want to know the, the, I, the more the church, the more we all want to give them what we have that we want to, know. because by the way, we also, us priests, all of us, of course, we never stop learning. Yeah. Everyone thinks we learn everything in our few years seminary. in seminary. So and I've like, learned so much and more now. now than, yeah. Oh yeah. I mean. So it, I remember the cassettes. I, it was great. I remember the CDs were great for a while. Remember those? Yeah, St. Joseph Communications. Yeah, they, they had, did great. Uh, Lighthouse Catholic Media. Uh, yeah, they, exactly. All they those. were all great uh, pioneers at the time. But, but now it's so accessible for everyone. And, and, and so many people uh, that perhaps, w which we, we I, I think in one way, we have a similar uh, part of our ministry is those people like the homebound and so many. Yeah. Because we have, for example, our virtual masses uh, at St. Patrick's Cathedral and that, you know, every day th tens of thousands of people uh, listen to and, and see. And then, of course, you have your ministry. But many people also that, that perhaps are going through things that it's hard for them to leave their homes. They might be going through some health issues, whatever. Of course, not to mention what we all went through with the pandemic some years ago. But it's so many people's lives are also like even 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 at, at when when they have the sufferings they're they're now so moved the church goes to them yeah and, and that's so beautiful and and you know there's something out yeah, as, you, as you mentioned about that that there's digitally reaching out which is so i mean i think is very very valuable and yet the church reminds us of the reality of the incarnation which is okay we have to also show up of you course, know, that, and it's not, they're not a mutually exclusive, right? They're, they're meant to be together. Yeah, yeah. And there's something about that. Whenever I talk to, um, usually there's like a, a Catholic school teacher or someone who volunteers for religious education or whatever the thing is. And they say, oh, um, I use your videos all the time in class, or I use these resources in when I teach the kids. Um, and they want to thank me, but then I think you're the one who's doing the, you're the one who's doing the hard work. Like relationships are the messy part. Oh, relationships yeah, 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 are the yeah. hard part. Like sitting behind a camera, in front of a camera, and be like record, blah blah blah, stop recording, upload. That's easy compared to 
the hard work, the difficult work, the, again, the, the messy work of relationships. And so it takes everyone, it, right? it of takes course. all of us. And I just, I keep going back to this conviction and I've said it before, I just wanna, is that while I am so grateful for, for media and for the, even this ability to be able to do this and to be able to spread the gospel through multimedia, all these, I believe the gospel won't be spread from the stage as much as it'll be spread through family and friendships. Mm -hmm. Because there, I, I need the resources. I want to learn more. I want to get close to the Lord. But when it comes to that handing on the faith, I think it's just deep French, real friendships. When we come into contact with these other real families that just, again, they just stick together and they have that, that messiness, but they still choose to love it. I think that's going to be what transforms the world. Definitely. When, when you take the knowledge and, 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 yeah. and, and put it in your heart yeah. and then make it your nature, who you are. Well, because you know, everyone always says to me, they're like, you make it sound like it's so easy. And I'm like, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying this is how you do it. <laughs> like, I've, um, But then when you see it lived out in someone, you yeah. see it like, okay, not just here's the talk with, you know, five points to a uh, holier life. But when you see, oh, this is, this is how a real human being in this country, in this state, whatever it is, how they actually live out their faith, well, that, now I know what that's like. Or you get loved, you get, actually get loved by someone who loves Jesus and you realize, oh, this is what it is to, to be loved. You know, so all those pieces, again, there, there's, there's, like you said, no excuse because we have so many great resources, but then also it, it, we can't just be consumers. We no, have to also no. be in that relationship. And, and of course, we remember the rule of thumb that if people are about, they should be going to mass yeah, to receive yeah, the yeah, Eucharist. Yeah. I mean, I always, when I speak to our, all our beloved homebound that watches, I always remind people, if, if you're homebound, just make sure you call your parish and make sure that yeah. someone's taking the Eucharist to you because we need the Eucharist. And, 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 and uh, it's not just about receiving. But it's beautiful to be able to offer that in the sense that uh, at least they can get a bit of both. Yeah. And something I, I remind people as well is like uh, it's something that's happened a lot with masses, with things like that as well is a, a lot of people is like, perhaps it shouldn't have that many virtual masses anymore because people had to get to the church. But of course, there's always the people that can't. Mm -hmm. But we also find, I'm sure you do too, that now there's people that are in the habit of going to daily mass. Yeah. That wasn't a thing before. Really, you see an uptick in that? Yeah, because before, before uh, you know, people just Sundays all enough for me. Now they get in the habit not to go physically, but as they're go driving their car, oh, yeah, yeah. As, you know, daily mass. They hear yeah. the gospel. They, he, they even they can't go physically. There, there, there's more of that habit, which is again uh, something that we had to thank God for. And I, I love that. You know, I love the opportunity to be able to offer the virtual masses um, for the people who are homebound. Yeah. And what we all always do is we say that. If you're, if you're kind of the quote unquote tuning in to this mass, it's probably because you are in a difficult season, right? You're in the middle of some suffering, whether that is your own suffering, you're caring for someone else or whatever the thing is. And just, we're offering this mass for you. And just to be able to hopefully try to bridge that gap if, 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 because you know, suffering and sickness are so isolating that it's just like, okay, but know that in this moment, this is for you. Another thing I found is that people will now double dip in the sense that they'll, they write to me and say, hey, we are going to mass. Yeah. And then we also want to <laughs> do, the, do the YouTube. I'm like, that's great. No problem. Uh, and I'm grateful for, for both of those things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, is that I remind people on the face of St. Clair that the first virtual mass happened in the 1200s of St. Clair. Tell me more. <laughs> okay, so, so in, the, in the 1200s, she, of course, when she lived, you know, one day it was Christmas Eve and she was, uh, she got very sick and she was dying. Of course, she was not, I mean, she was, she was really wanted to be at the mass and, and she prayed to God's like, I, 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 please help me get to the mass. But then her health didn't improve and the mass was about to start. And then she explained this. No one knew what she was talking about. The mass that was happening in the chapel was in her wall. <laughs> so she got the first televised mass. That's amazing. In in the history, I mean, this is in the 1200s. Yeah. I mean, when she explained it, like 
who, what is this? Yeah. I mean, so so in the 1950s, the, the Pope at the time, I forget which of the Popes made her the patroness of television. Really? It's crazy, I had no idea. And no one even knew what she was talking about. And then television begins. And then, and then, and then that's, and then, you know, that uh -huh. she had that experience, that she had the first televised mass. And it's amazing how, you know, God has always uh, used that. By the way, let's not forget to thank Mother Angelica too. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah. I just, well, I mean, I'm thinking of, I mentioned St. Joseph Communications and there was a guy, I don't even, I can't remember the name of the man who started that, but he started it in his living room. He just copied tapes and put stickers on them to be able to distribute them and sell them out of the back of his car or even give them away. And I think in Mother Angelica, it's something similar where they just, she starts with what she has and then just uses it. And it's just, it, it's incredible. I, I, so we're trying to build a church uh, on campus because okay. we, don't have, we don't have a student center or a, a church. We just have a little two car garage we use as our daily mass chapel. And we have mass on campus in a ballroom. And then we, as I mentioned, on Sunday nights, we go to the cathedral about a mile away from campus. So it's time to try to, and <laughs> there is, a, you know, so we're trying to ask people like, would you like to help us support our, you know, building a thing? And uh, this woman who, woman who uh, we started telling her about the project about a year ago. And she's like, I've been praying about this, you know, and just really beautiful woman, just incredible. And that's just like, her heart is just so good. And her faith is alive. She's like, I don't think you should have a budget. I think you should do it like what mother Angelica did. Just say, God, whatever kind of church you want, bring the money. And she's like, that's what you need. No budget. I'm like, well, would you like to start writing a check? Because that'd be great. But there's something about that. That's just like mother Angelica just lived on God's providence. Yeah. And there's one thing to live on God's providence with it, with the idea of subsistence. We love God's providence and he's gonna bring just what we need. Mm -hmm. But then there's that sense of living on God's providence with a mentality of abundance and saying, God, if you want to this be blessed, you want this to, to bless your children who need to hear your voice and need to hear the good news, um, then just let, let it explode. Let, let it become what it's become. And uh, it's amazing. And yeah, it's not, it wasn't her uh, masterminding the, the, development and key strategies it was her just trusting in the lord and knowing that he would he would deliver and he did he has he does and, he, and yeah of course and so it's beautiful to see that because again as we were both talking and know and we see it and that's why it's important for us to tell people the holy spirit's moving yeah and he has been always in this church and 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 we have to uh thank him for that yeah you even said that like he has always been moving and that's, that's so true. Like we even think of like times of when we don't know history or whatever, we just these lulls in the movement of the Holy Spirit. Like, no, God's always been moving. Every generation he's been raising up saints, every generation. When, we, when we're at our worst in our history is when we have like the great saints, yeah. like St. Francis of Assisi, for example, going back to, yeah. So, so that we had to keep on trusting. And another question that has to do with all this as well, um, so what, what, what would, would your advice be to, uh, to, for example, us priests, especially in, 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 the, in the parishes and so on, when it comes to two things, so it's like a two-fold question, because <laughs> like, these are your, your missions. Um, how, what, what would you think, priests, uh, we should all have a staple in parishes to attract young adults and young people? Because, you know, that's a gift that you have, and so many young adults have been nurtured plus you know you're in in a college campus so you know like like that kid that came up to you and said ah, i wish i started this four years ago yeah. and what what do you have any advice that we can that the parishes that you've seen that works or that maybe you've discerned that that parishes should like you know use more and, and like or, or or priests like integrate more in their in their parish life and the other question is the same but with social media, you know, right. th I mean, there's, there's, cause there can be an oversaturation too. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, we all started to just, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we have to be, uh, each in our own mission of evangelizing, but, but at the end, at the, on the other hand, it is the future of the way we communicate in so many ways and not the future, it's the present, right? you know? So, so do you have any thoughts about either? I guess my initial thoughts are leverage. There's one word of both of it is leverage. And so um, in where we are on a college campus, that's we want to leverage what we have. Well, you are here at Old St. Pat's, you know, here's, here's a group of young adults who come here to leverage that. But you also have um, at, at uh, 
I, my, my hometown in the Diocese of Duluth is a smallish town, maybe 20 to 30,000 people in that, maybe even not that, I'm not sure what the population is, but not very big. And so if they were to have a young adult ministry, I would say, okay, leverage what you have. And that's the, the big thing is like, who are the young adults who are, um, who are there, who are invested, who want to grow? And to be able to begin with them, begin with what you have, mm -hmm. as opposed to be like, we need to cast this wide net yeah, for, yeah, yeah. for um, those we don't have yet. Now that's gonna come, I would say. But if on one level, we can get the ones we have and then be able to say, okay, how can we help you in your formation? How can we help you in discipleship? How can we help you in this, that you're taking the next steps? But that's good, that's, that's, we don't like starting small, I think. I know. Uh, it, but it's like, but just Pope Benedict the 16th, he said something along the lines. He says, that's the way of the kingdom of God. It's what Jesus said, which is it starts out like a mustard seed, but then it's supposed to grow. But it, he says, be, Pope Benedict said, beware of those flashy, uh, the big programs that make a big splash because the kingdom of God always starts small. And there's something about that. So liberty, same thing with the social media or with the media is there's a difference, I think, between, okay, I need to make my own, which is fine. That's good if a person has a skill and the time and all that stuff. Yeah. Versus how do we leverage leverage what's out there? And so you have people who are, I mean, Father Gregory Pine, who is, you know, Dominican, he's just a genius. He, he speaks Thomas Aquinas. Like he just like, the way he talks, I think I, I've never used that word before, but I make sense what you're saying. I just, it's, it's so clear, concise and ordered that I think, okay, he's covered this topic. How would I leverage what he's already said? I don't have to create that myself. Yeah. Or the Dominican, Dominicans have their whole new YouTube channel. You have Father or Bishop Barron, you know, we have all these materials out there that is, so make new stuff. Yeah, if, that, if you're inclined to that or leverage what is out there and, and let, uh, let yourself be a connector rather than a creator sometimes. Sometimes it's better to be, a, not better, but sometimes it'll be more powerful to be a connector than a creator. I, I 100% agree. So, yeah. As a thought. Yeah, yeah, 100%. You're here right now in New York, and and this will probably will be seen after the events that we have planned uh, tonight and tomorrow, especially, which is uh, this big procession that the Napa Institute has has uh, planned in, the, in St. Patrick's Cathedral and so on, which we're very excited about. But of course, one of the main reasons all this is happening is because we're in this year of Eucharistic revival. And uh, that basically we have to remember the, of everything that we've just mentioned, the base of our faith, which is the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. So do you have any, any advice or any thoughts on, on, on how we can all like grow in, in, in that faith? Like how, how are you taking this year of the Eucharist revival, you know, at heart in, in, in your ministry and the way that you teach others. It's so good. That's a, just a great question because I think, I think I've heard a lot about the Eucharistic revival and I know there's a lot of planning for the big events over this upcoming summer. And even like you said, tonight and tomorrow, but what is it that, what's the call to action? Like what, it, what is it that we're being asked to do as, as Catholics? Because I remember, I, I think I, heard Monsignor Shea from the you Mary out in Bismarck. Uh, he had, he had, he, he had given a, a talk and he said that people are saying, uh, father, you have to priest, more priests have to talk about the real presence. And Monsignor Shea said, he's like that. Sure. But he said, I don't know one priest out there who isn't, I, I don't know one priest out there who isn't saying Jesus is truly present body, both soul and divinity in the Eucharist. And that this is like you said, the heart of our faith. And so, what's missing? Is it we need more priests preaching this or is it something else? I wonder if it's not about the event, the Eucharistic revival itself, as much as it is about what's the invitation. So an, an example, last Advent, um, so I, I try to do like series when it comes to Sunday masses and homilies and stuff. And so leading into Advent, like Advent's a good four week series. Um, what should it be on? And I just became so convicted. Uh, there's this man who was in prison up in Duluth and a uh, federal prison. And he had fallen in love with the Lord. He had his life, God had changed his life before he went to prison. But then when he got there, there was a, uh, he had access to uh, the chapel and they shared the chapel with a bunch of different faiths, but they had a tabernacle with our Lord present. And he said that he had a lot of free time in prison and he spent hours, he, maybe thousands of hours with Jesus in the tabernacle 
in present in the Eucharist. At one point, he was almost out, and this man, he had been a Leavenworth for years, and this man had been a, you know, he was, he was in there for some serious, serious and violent crimes. And he'd been dabbling with Christianity, but he saw something in the man who's become my friend. He saw something in him and he said, hey, how do I get what you have kind of thing? And the guy was like, listen, you have six months left and you're gonna be out. I, I can't, I'm not gonna argue with you. I'm not gonna take a uh, debate with you. Here's what I need you to do. If I'm gonna give you some time, what I need you to do is for the next 30 days, you're gonna go into that chapel and you're gonna put yourself in, in presence of Jesus for one hour a day, 60 minutes every single day. And you're gonna beg Jesus to reveal himself to you in prayer. And so he's like, oh, yeah, here's the deal. You're gonna tell me when you're gonna do it because I'll pop my head in there. If you're not there, we're done. And he's just like, laid down the line. And he's, this guy was in, in, in jail for white collar crime and he's threatening this guy who's in jail for violent crime. Um, but uh, he said he showed up every day, every day. He said day 27 happened and this man took off out of the chapel and he's running across the yard asking him, where's, you know, this guy's name, where, where is he, where is he, where is he? He said, I met him. He, he showed himself to me. He's like, he took my heart in his hands and brought me to himself and just, I know that's Jesus. He went through RCIA. The man's a Catholic now. He is this massively converted, huge repentance of his whole life. His life is different. So I remember I was heard about this because that happened up in my hometown or my town and was so moved to say, okay, for Advent, last year's Advent was 29 days. So how about this? 29 minutes for 29 days. Every day, just going in front of our Lord in the Eucharist for 29 days, 29 minutes. And you don't have to be perfect. Don't have to be, you're not, we're not in prison, but, but to be able to make a, some kind of commitment. I remember talking with a woman this last summer and she's a, a wife, she's a mother of a couple of kids. And she said, well, you said that on that first Advent. I was like, no way. I can't, I have responsibilities. I have work, I have family. And she said, but I did it. And there's some days I didn't know how it was gonna happen, but I, I drove to the church, it was locked. I just parked my car in the parking lot for 29 minutes. I'm gonna pray because I know you're in there, Jesus. And she said, it changed my life. And that's the kind of thing I think we need to start doing is start, starting to say, okay, what's the call to action? The call to action is not just learn more about the Eucharist. The call to action is not just, hey, priest, talk more about the Eucharist. I think the call to action is for each Catholic who hears the call to be able to say, I'm gonna make some kind of commitment that rain or shine I'm gonna place myself in the Lord's presence. No, it doesn't have to be 29 minutes, it doesn't have to be 60 minutes, but to be able to say, and maybe it's only five days a week, five days a week, I'm gonna stop by a chapel, a our church, and I'm gonna place myself in the Lord's presence and just beg him to reveal himself to me. Maybe that's the call to action. Because um, I think that there's something about this that we know it's true, but I don't know if that we live like it's true. So we're trying to bridge that gap. I could be wrong, but I think that might be uh, it. That's beautiful, and 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 that's and that's really our job is we we uh, imagine we're, we we our, our Lord uses us to bring Himself into into the world, but all of us, and not just us priests, but all of us as disciples, exactly what you just said, like that man in jail, is to now invite others to meet Him. Yeah, and 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 uh, not just tell them tell people about Him, but it's like He wants to meet you. And he'll take it from there. Right. Because <laughs> he was like, I could argue with you. Yeah. But then it's me. It's yeah. me arguing with you. You just go in front of our Lord. Yeah. Let him reveal himself to you. If we did all did that, I think we would really have a Eucharistic revival. I think we, there would be a rise we really revival. Needed. Yeah. So I'm so happy that you're here. And it's, it's, and, it's so and, good to be here. And uh, thank you so much for, for the beautiful interview, for all your words and and know that you're always welcome here uh, in New York at St. Patrick's Cathedral and here at the Basilica. And it's just uh, a great blessing. We're all very grateful that you're here. And, and I know God's going to move a lot uh, in these days with all the plans that he has. Amen. So thank, so you. thank you, Father Mike. You are welcome. And I'm grateful for you as well. Thank you.